Hey -o. So I'm gonna try and look at the camera today. I keep not looking at myself so much. Make sure I look alright. Uh, how's everybody doing? I'm excited to uh, be reading chapter 5 today. I had so much fun reading chapters 3 and 4 yesterday. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, another really cool thing, I'm starting to interview channel uh, where I interview authors, uh, creative people. Um, a lot of people I've met on Twitter in the writing community and the feedback I've got has been fantastic. And so I'll be putting up videos, uh, doing interviews with them here shortly. I got two interviews set up for today. I'm really excited about talking to these people, very cool people. Um, yeah, man, life is going so good, you know? Um, and it's just like being able to help other people and help myself too. <laughs> in the process which is neat because life is a win-win you know when you when you start doing the right things uh, everyone can get what they need um, I believe that for sure uh, so without further ado I'll uh, get into chapter 5 but do a real quick recap so Sir A. John's a super zombie he uh, he's been tasked by the king King Arthur to go fight a dragon at Devil's Peak and um, so he's going to be going up to Devil's Peak to fight this dragon. Um, as he was getting ready, Margaret comes and wants to join him. And Margaret decides that she wants to go on adventures and she's excited about fighting dragons. So <clears throat> she's going to join him. She got, she's got she got like a, a nice a scythe, which is like a half a crescent moon. Yeah, crescent moon type um, weapon that's really sharp. They used for uh, cutting wheat. As farmers cutting wheat, wheat cutting, um, but she's gonna use it for harming things. So, uh, and we talked to, we just talked to Gravely, Gravely, or no, I'm sorry, we're about to, we're going to meet Gravely at the uh, at the creek because Gravely's at the creek doing something weird because she's a witch, and witches do weird things at creeks. Uh, so we're gonna go find out. So chapter five is called A Witch's Assistant. And, uh, drink my happy juice. Here we go. Chapter 5. A Witch's Assistant. The way towards the creek was just a bit outside the town's walls, set at the back of the castle. Margaret and Essay made their way out of the city gates and headed toward the witch. Gravely was standing ankle-deep in creek water in a dress that resembled an old white nightgown with flowers on it, hiked up to her knees. Her hair, dark as death, tangled and wild as ever, fell past her shoulders. She stood calling, calling the toads, making weird croaking noises, and hopping around splashing water. With reflexes that would make a cat green, she launched out to her left, stretching as far as she could, and landed with a splash in the creek. Her right hand shot in the air, declaring victory, holding a big green blob of a toad, its eyes bulging out wildly at being captured. A cackle rose from the creek bed as Gravely laughed with her, in her triumph. Wow, nice catch, Gravely. I don't think, I don't even think I would have been able to do that. Well, I am a witch, young man. I have been catching toads since I was just a baby. It's in my blood, Gravely said, swelling with pride. Ha! Huh, that's a weird thing to have in your blood, Gravely. Sounds like a rare condition. You should see a doctor. Ajum threw his head back with laughter. <laughs> oh, shut up, you fool! Why have you come out here to disturb me during my morning ritual? And who is this terrifying young woman with you? Ah, well, I was hoping you had some more of that epoxy you gave me. You know, for my condition. Oh, you need more glue to keep your nipples from falling off again? Yeah, it's in my bag. Looking ashen-faced and extremely embarrassed, Sir Ajahn just smiled, his eyes darting back and forth between a giggling Margaret and a disinterested Gravely. Thankfully, his heart didn't work anymore, so he didn't have to worry about blood rushing to his face. Great. Thank you, Gravely. This will come in handy. Now, we must be off. Long day of traveling, Sir Ajon said in a deep, brave voice. Curious, Gravely asked, And where is it you're going, needing so much glue? 
Surely you're the king, but he won't. We'll hold up for a few days. Well, Gravely, if you must know, we are going to slay a dragon at Devil's Beak, per the king's orders. Special mission. I was handpicked. Sir Aegean lifted his head and placed his hands to his armored chest. Oh, yeah. That's right. I remember the king and Lancelot talking about sending some worthless freak show off to his death. They high-fived and laughed, I think. Gravely nodded in a, with a sarcastic smile. It took. It looked like all the air had been let out of Sir Aegean as he slumped on his horse. Well, well, that is not going to happen, Margaret exclaimed with as much conviction as she could muster. We are going to go up there and kick that dragon's butt. Looking at Gravely proudly, her chin held high. Yeah, yeah, look, you two, I've heard it all before. Striking out, going to make a name for yourself. <laughs> Challenging the powers they be and winning favor again. It never works out. Do you truly understand how dangerous dragons are? I mean, they are almost as big as a mountain. They shoot fire from their mouths and they can fly and are armored like a tank. Wait, what is a tank? Sir Aegon asked, confused. Ha! Oh! Ah, uh, never mind that. Sometimes I forget what century I am in. Gravely said, quickly hopping to, hoping to change the subject. Looking uncertain, Sir Aegon responded with all the hope he could find. Listen, Gravely, I understand all of that. I even told Margaret here the official dragon versus human stats. But what choice do I have? Either way, they want me gone. I might as well try. Not to mention, I am different now. I may be powerful enough to slay a dragon. <laughs> no, silly boy, you are not. But I will give you credit for being so optimistic. Here, take this. It may come in handy. <sighs> Holding the fat green toad out in front of her, she thrust it up into Sir Aegean's hand. Gravely, what am I to do with this toad? How will it be of any help for me? Look, your journey is hopeless, trust me. But if somehow it's not, this toad may help you with the dragon. Well, what do I do? Should I throw it at the dragon when I see it? Is this some sort of magic toad bomb or something? Looking annoyed, Gravely took a long, slow breath. Just hang on to it. Trust me. Placing the toad in his saddlebag, Sir Aegon reached down to shake Gravely's hand. Thank you, Gravely. We will surely need all the help we can get. And off they rode. Without another look back, Gravely sighed heavily as she watched them go. As much as an, of an idiot as she found the boy to be, she knew he had a good heart and didn't like to see him being sent off to his death again. Good luck, you moron! She called. May the toad be with you! She whispered, laughing loudly to herself. <laughs> chapter break. Alright, so chapter five was really short, so we're gonna... I didn't say it loud enough. Chapter five was pretty short. Um, we're gonna go into chapter six. The Dark Forest. It's gonna be dark. Hope you're having fun with the story so far. Here we go. Chapter 6. Son. Sons. And daughters. And friends and family. Okay. Chapter 6. The Dark Forest. Ooh. The mountains looked so majestic and beautiful as our two heroes rode toward them in the early morning. From this distance it seemed unreasonable to think that a terrifying and menacing dragon lay in wait on the snow-capped peaks just ahead. It was maybe a two days journey to the base of the mountain, so getting as far as possible before dark and setting up camp was today's goal. Luckily, the sky was clear and it was not too hot out, so the horses would be able to move quickly without much need of, need of rest. 
They were, however, in no rush, as it seemed all too likely they were on their way to their death. Ribbit! Ribbit! Do you hear that? Toad essay! He seems to like to talk quite a bit. Yes, yes, I hear him. What kind of a gift is a toad when heading in to do battle with a dragon? Surely this toad possesses some magic that we do not yet know of. I sure hope so. It would be a great help to have a magic toad as a part of our gang. This is no gang, my lady. We are simply traveling companions. And if I do not get some fresh brains to eat soon, then I will be traveling alone. Because I will have to eat you. You will not eat my brains, I am sure of it. Let's go find you some wild animal to eat, or even a leopard. You can eat a leopard brain, right? I mean, no one would miss a leopard. Ew! The thought of that is so gross. All those lesions, ew. It would be like picking anchovies off of a pizza. The pizza is just never the same. Sir Ajon's face was twisted in disgust, sticking out his tongue at the thought. Well, don't worry. We will find something. We are getting close to the dark forest, Margaret said, sure of herself. Have you ever noticed how everything around the castle has a foreboding name? Dark Forest, Devil's Peak. It's like they're trying to scare us or something. I mean, that makes this forest any what makes this forest any darker than any other forest? You may be the strangest knight I have ever met. Margaret said, looking dryly at Sir Aegeon. Yes, well, my dear, these are all questions that should be asked. A king that propagates fear to scare his people from doing anything is not the kind of king I want to follow. Yes, I suppose you are right, but maybe we should hold off judgment until we see what's in this dark forest. I mean, it does look pretty dark from here. I think I hear noises coming out of it as well. No. I'm afraid that is my stomach. I'm going to go full zombie in a moment if I don't eat. Sir Ajon grabbed his stomach as it growled with hunger. Rushing forward, Sir Ajon and Margaret reached the edge of the forest and looked at each other with concern in their eyes. That's my concerned face. Yeah, see? It's really dark in there, S.A. Guess the king is just calling it like he sees it. Did you bring a torch? Margaret asked, holding a hand out to Sir Aegeon in hope of light. I believe so. Let me check my bag. Opening his saddlebag, a bright green glow erupted from inside. Ha ha! Look at this! The toad glows in the dark! That's pretty cool! I hope he does more than glow in the dark, though, Sir Aegeon chided, gazing at the eerie glow of the toad. Rip it! Yeah! Giving us a glow-in-the-dark toad to fight a dragon seems woefully inadequate, Margaret noticed. Well, maybe it does other stuff too, like bounce really high or something. Holding the toad high in the air, Sir Aegon launched the toad at the ground. Splat! Nope! <laughs> he definitely doesn't bounce. <laughs> but he sure can take a lick. Look at that! He hopped right back up. Tough little guy, Sir Aegon commented commended the toad, rip, glowing more fiercely as the toad croaked again. I think you made him angry. Try not to break the toad before we get to the dragon. Gravely said it would be useful. Yes, yes, I know. I won't break the toad, Sir Aegon said defensively. Deciding to tie the toad to the head of his horse, Sir Aegon led the way into the forest. The eerie green glow of the toad threw sharp shadows all over the forest floor, as tree branches swayed back and forth from a wind that seemed to come out of nowhere. Off in the distance, a bird crowed. I think it was a crow. Then, the haunting sound of a distant screams punctuated the misty air. What the heck was that? Is this some kind of Halloween store or something? Sir Aegeon shouted. I don't know. It is very spooky, though. I'm sure there is all kinds of weird stuff for you to eat in here. Why don't we tie our horses up to that tree that looks like it has a scowling face? Then we can look around. Yeah, that sounds like a great idea. 
What better place for a zombie to shop for a brain food than this dark, haunted forest? I have a good feeling about this. Oh, if I had eyes, they would be rolling right now. These two have got to be the dumbest couple of idiots around. I can't believe I let my wife talk me into this job. Go be a disembodied narrating voice. It will be fun, she said. You will get to travel and have an adventure, she said. Ugh. Anyway, back to work. The horses stirred as they were tied to the tree. Sir Aegeon untied the toad from the horse's head and tied it instead around his own head. Kind of like a spelunking helmet. Off into the forest he went, with Margaret at his back. The forest was thick with trees and brush, so Sir Aegeon pulled Ralph the Ravager from his scabbard and began slicing and dicing his way through. Just a few minutes in, a clearing appeared, and light actually broke through the trees. It was a beautiful sight to behold. In the middle of the seemingly terrifying forest was a grove that looked to harbor all the life in the place. Except for that one rogue crow, I suppose. Deer danced and dashed over and around each other, playing so gleefully while herds of sheep could be seen grazing not far off in the distance. A family of rabbits hopped happily along right in front of Sir Aegeon, who immediately and violently devoured the whole lot of them. Well, there goes the night, my, that nice moment, and also my lunch. Excuse me. <sighs> Holy crap, Esse. Holy crap, Esse. That was absolutely savage. Those cute little bunnies didn't stand a chance. You fool now? Or you want to eat one of those happy-looking deer over there? Margaret asked with a strangely pleasant smile on her face. Oh, yeah. She's mine. Flying towards the helpless deer like a two-legged cheetah, Sir Aegeon wrestled the deer to the ground and finished it off. He can really move for a dead guy with no legs. That was really impressive. Finally satiated from his hunger, Sir Aegeon and Margaret made their way back to the horse. Essay, I just want to tell you that after seeing you tear apart those helpless little woodland creatures, I am way more confident now, more than ever that we are going to kick that dragon's butt. Looking back at Margaret, Sir John sheepishly replied, Ah, uh, come on. Ha, <sighs> that was nothing. Sir John said, trying to sound modest. No, I'm serious. You, you, no, I'm serious. You have some truly terrifying skills. I had no idea how talented you were. Margaret smiled sweetly at John and continued to walk. As the day wore on, the two traveled ever onward toward their death through the despair and fear of the dark forest, trying to make it out before nightfall. Although I'm not sure it could get much darker, it had to have been getting late, though, as they had been traveling nonstop for the past six hours, and it seemed they had reached the densest part of the forest. Trees and bushes grew over top of one another, and giant roots jutted harshly out of the damp forest floor. There had been no other sign of life, or even movement for that matter, since they had left the clearing. Thinking they may have taken, on a, uh, taken a wrong turn, Sir Aegon reached into his saddlebag and pulled out the map that the king gave him, hoping to find some solace with their current heading. Are you... are we going the right way? Margaret asked. Um, well, this map isn't very descriptive. Holding it up to the light showed the map was simply a drawing of the castle with dotted lines leading out to a picture of a bunch of trees, and the words dark forest above them, followed by more dotted lines leading out of the forest to the foot of a picture of the mountains, with a big X on it. Well, that's, well, that's not help, very helpful. Why the heck would he give you that? We didn't, need, we didn't need a map to figure out we had to go through the forest to get to the mountains. Is there anything on the back? Flipping the map over, Sir Aegon hopeful Sir Aegon's hopeful face fell as he showed the picture to Margaret. It was a picture of a hand with the middle finger raised, and underneath it it said, "Your number one." Hmm. I don't believe I don't believe he means it when he says I'm number one. Sir Aegon said sadly, "Uh, duh." 
You think? Margaret said, smacking the side of her head and making a duh face. I suppose we better continue on in the direction we are heading. Eventually we will come out the other side, right? Why are you why are you asking me? You are the knight. I have never ventured past the town walls. You're supposed to know this stuff. Yeah, well, it's not like I ever wanted to be a knight. This decision was made for me. You don't get to have that choice when your dad is the most famous knight in history. Oh boy, here we go. Are you about to tell me all your daddy issues? Margaret said, rolling her eyes and throwing her hands in the air. It's just not fair, you know. I'm only 17, and I have already lost my legs and died. And all because I, wa I, I was made to do something I don't even like. I've never even kissed a girl, but I've killed hundreds of men in battle. Does that seem a bit off to you? I'm just pretending to know what I'm doing. Up until getting my legs cut off and being turned into this undead monster, I was just going along with what my dad wanted me to do. Now, they expect me to journey to basically uncharted territory unless you consider this poor excuse for a map charted and fight a freaking dragon. Yeah, I got some issues with that. I don't want to be a zombie. I don't want to have to go through scary forests and eat cute little bunnies and deer. I don't want to be eaten or melted by a big mean dragon. I want to live a normal life and have friends and go out with girls and read books and watch plays. I want to live again. No one will ever love me. I want to be around. No one will ever want to be around me. I am worse than dead. I am a monster. Aegeon poured out his soul, leaving him winded and drained. He was obviously very distraught. Margaret actually had tears in her eyes. She had felt the same way about her life. She wanted it to be different too. And it all just seemed so unfair. Quietly and gently, she put her arm around Sir Aegeon's shoulder and pulled him close. They sat there like that for a while, neither wanting the other to let go or willing to leave the other side. Only the sound of the toad brought them back to their present reality. Ribbit! Ribbit! Thank you for listening, Margaret. I have never told anyone any of that before. No problem, I say. I understand. Margaret, Margaret gave a small, a small smile to Sir Ajon, who looked back with his own. What do you say we call it a day and set up camp? It's not like we have to hurry and get to that freaking dragon. It will probably still be there no matter how long we take. Yeah, that's a good idea. I will set up camp. Do you want to give? Do you want to go try and find some firewood? Sure. That sounds like a plan. I can get behind. Here, take the toad, Margaret. I can see okay without it now. Unstrapping the toad from his forehead, Sir Aegeon handed the little glowing green friend back, back to Margaret, who happily accepted with a bow of her head. Sir Aegeon and Margaret both dismounted from their steeds as Margaret set to the task of clearing a space on the forest floor bef big enough for a fire and two beds. Sir Aegeon led the horses over to a tree and tied them up. Making sure the ropes were secure, he hobbled off farther into the forest, picking up as much dry brush and fallen branches as he could, hold, as he could hold in one arm. It hadn't been but five minutes since he left Margaret when, he undeni when the, her undeniable scream came piercing through the dense forest mist. Startled and with alarm in his lifeless eyes, Sir Aegeon dropped all that he had gathered and bolted as fast as he could back to where he left Margaret. Upon reaching their settlement, he was surprised to find that she was no longer alone, and that the green glow from the toad had dissipated. The thing standing before her was roughly the height of Sir Aegeon sans the legs. He had a big, oblong-shaped head with the ugliest red hair on top, and big, bulging eyes with a mouth twice the size of a normal person's, and was completely naked. Margaret, are you okay? What happened? Sir Ajan yelled as he came galloping onto the scene, his eyes squarely on the newest edition. The toad, he... it... it changed. I just set it down while I worked, and the next minute I turn around, and that thing is staring at me. Wow, it is very unsightly, 
That is for sure. A red-headed toad man. Has it spoken? Sir Ajam looked on in disgust. No, he has just stood there like a freak since we turned. Hmm, very odd. Hey, toad boy, can you hear me? Do you speak? Slowly, Sir Ajon approached the thing using as much caution as possible. Now standing directly in front of the thing, Sir Ajon looked in its black, big black eyes and... Hello! Poking the toad human in the chest. After not getting any response, he turned to look at Margaret, her eyes going wide. Sir Ajon whipped back around. In his fright, Sir Ajon went flying backwards, landing roughly on a giant root protruding out of the ground. <laughs> I told you I'd scare him good. <laughs> you should have seen your face. The toad creature mimed Sir Ajon's frightened, moronic face. What the? What the heck? You knew he was going to scare me, Margaret. Ajon asked in, in disbelief, looking at a bent over Margaret, trying and failing miserably to stop laughing. <laughs> ah, I'm so sorry. I thought we could all use a laugh after what just happened. And the toad just transformed into this person thing out of nowhere while I was setting up camp and came up with the idea immediately. Like the only reason he turned into a person was to scare you. Incredible, really, she said, nodding her head. Sir Aegean's face hung low on his chest, shaking his head slowly, taking in what Margaret had just told him, and what had just happened. Without warning, a large booming laugh erupted from Sir Aegean, a laugh that it seemed only a children have. Throwing his head back, arms behind him, holding his weight, he laughed. No, he roared with laughter. The others joined in as well. <laughs> Unable to help the contagious nature of it all, and the sheer ridiculousness. Even the woodland creatures came out to see what all the laughter was about. Foxes came out of their holes. A family of deer peeked out from behind trees. Even birds and bears looked from where they were, were hiding to take in the scene. All unable to hold their own laughter. It was quite the scene. Soon, the others' laughter faded as the creatures departed back into their homes, and Margaret and Toad stopped as well. Beginning to feel a bit concerned for Sir Aegean as he continued to laugh, <laughs> they looked from one to the other. Margaret approached Sir Aegean in hopes of getting him to stop. Lightly touching his shoulder, she said, Ha! Huh, I am glad you are able to laugh at its essay. Can we get back to setting up camp now? Ha! Ha ha! Oh! Oh, ye, oh yes! I am sorry. I haven't laughed like that since I was a little girl. Wow, I feel so good now. Yes, let's get back to work. First, let's get this toad some clothes. Do you have a name? Sir Aegean said, wiping tears of laughter from his eyes. Yeah, it's Frog, the toad said with no emotion. Your name is Frog, and you're a toad? Look, man, my parents thought it was ironic. It was the early 1560s. They weren't in their right minds. Oh, yeah, uh, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I understand, Frog. Say no more. Reaching into his saddlebag, Sir Ajon produced a pair of slacks and a white undershirt. Here, here, use this. It should keep you warm enough for now. I didn't bring any shoes for, uh, obvious reasons. I hope you are okay with going barefoot. Yeah, man. Yeah, man, no worries. I'm as tough as a toad. I don't need shoes. Ha! Huh. Okay, great. Well, let's all get back to it. I will go get the firewood. Camp had been set up and the fire had, made, had been made. Everyone was very tired from a long day of travel and ready to get some rest. Deciding it was best to get some sleep before questioning Frog the Toad, Aegean said goodnight to, to Margaret and Frog and laid his head down and was fast asleep. That night, the dreams that invaded Sir Aegean's consciousness were all very strange. In his first dream, he had both his legs back and was wearing a very strange outfit. It was all black, except for the shirt. Long black pants leading to black shoes and wearing a black jacket. 
There was a strange red piece of cloth hanging down the middle of his torso, coming from his neck as if it were tied there, and in fact it appeared to have a knot in it. Standing behind a large wooden pulpit, he was screaming and yelling, what seemed to be utter nonsense, crowds of the strangest dressed people you have ever seen. And behind him was a gigantic image of himself smiling stupidly. The strangest thing was the big glass eyes all over the room, directed solely at him with flashing red lights on top. Tossing and turning, Aegon's dream transformed. This time he was dressed like a knight, but a very strange knight. Every time he moved, mechanical noises came from his suit. He was walking around, what looked like a city of which he had never seen before. Massive buildings that reached all the way to the sky, with lights pouring out of every inch of them. The ground that he walked on was black and extremely hard. Suddenly a device came out of the side of his leg, like a stick in the shape of an L, with a button on the handle. And when he pressed the button, with his metallic finger, loud explosions <laughs> erupted from the end of the thing. He had heard himself speak in a very strange, deep voice. Freeze, perp. You're under arrest. Waking with a start, glad to be out of such a weird bunch of dreams, Ajan looked around. It was early morning and only embers were left from the fire. His friends were still sound asleep, the sound of their heavy breathing filling the air. Well, since he was up, he might as well go and get something to eat before he, the others wake. Off Ajan went to find food. Upon his return, Margaret and Toad were up and rolling up their, up their beds, each of them eating the rations Margaret had packed for the trip. Good morning, you two. Are you ready to set out on our journey once more and go slay this dragon? Well, you seem to be in a much better mood this morning, Margaret noted. Yes, Margaret, thank you for noticing, Sir Aegean said in a very serious tone. I had some pretty wild dreams last night, and I woke up with a realization that my life could be worse, you know? It's up to me to make the most of the one I have. Huh! Must have been some pretty crappy dreams. I'm glad you feel better, said Margaret with a yawn. <sighs> I do, and I'm ready to take the dragon down and bring its head to the king, proving to them that I am worthy. Sir Aegean looked off into the distance with his chest out and head held high. Okay, okay, cool. Frog, you ready? Margaret asked. Heck yeah, I hate dragons. They are just like big jerk versions of toads with cool powers and stuff. So basically nothing alike. I mean, besides the fact that you and a dragon always look slimy and wet even when you're not. Aegean said sarcastically, Hey man, toads and dragons have been around for millennia before you humans ever showed up. Show some respect. <laughs> Take it easy, frog. I believe you. You're just like a dragon. Under his breath, Aegean whispered to Margaret, Jeez, this guy seems pretty jealous of dragons like he lost the gene pool lottery. Hey, what did you say? I heard that. Oh, <laughs> oh, nothing, nothing. You are a very wise and learned toad. We will listen to you, Sir Aegean said, unable to hold back a small chuckle. <laughs> Whatever, man. Let's go, Frog retorted indignantly. Chapter break. So I'm going to go ahead and stop it here. Uh, we got a lot of reading done today. We got some new characters. Frog the Toad, man. He's in there. We just saw Aegean go full zombie mode on some sweet little cute crittery creatures and have some crazy, crazy dreams. <laughs> um, that was a lot of fun. My voices. I'm going to have to like do voice exercises, you know, like eat lemons and smoke honey or something. Anywho, uh, had a lot of fun. If you like this, please like, share, comment. Um, subscribe to the channel like I said I'm gonna be doing videos interviews with uh, a lot of really cool authors and creators soon so be looking out for those um, but tomorrow we'll be back uh, starting back in chapter 7 or I'm sorry, sorry chapter 6 the dark forest uh, we just have a little bit more to go there and then we'll move on to chapter 7 everybody 
thanks for joining the white side, the ma the auth the creator, Matt Matthew, author white side show on the Uniwebs, where all people become one peoples. Okay, bye. Yo, let me ask you a question. You like this video? Huh? Huh? Just like it? Was it good? Was it good? If you did like it, uh, please subscribe. Thanks.